Welcome, everybody, to this special bonus episode of Daily Dose of Aramaic. And it's just a tremendous joy to be able to invite our special guest today, Dr. Adam Howell. Adam Howell is Associate Professor of Old Testament Interpretation at Boyce College on the campus of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He is author of Ruth, A Guide to Reading Biblical Hebrew, Ruth, An Illustrated Hebrew Reader's Edition, and Illustrated First Kings in Hebrew. Furthermore, Dr. Howell is co-author of Hebrew for Life, Strategies for Learning, Retaining, and Reviving Biblical Hebrew. All that having been said, it is most likely that subscribers of Daily Dose of Aramaic know him, or at least know his voice, <laughs> as the host of our sister ministry, Daily Dose of Hebrew. So it's a pleasure to spend this time together with Dr. Hal for this special episode of Daily Dose of Aramaic. Welcome, Dr. Hal. Yeah, thank you. It's great to, great to be here. Wonderful. <laughs> now, this uh, episode is going to air a little bit later, but we have just finished actually meeting each other for the first time in person <laughs> yeah, at the Greek and Hebrew for Life Conference 2023 at the campus of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, it's just a pleasure all around uh, to, to meet uh, Dr. Howell for the first time. I met Dr. Flatt, the host of Daily Dose of Latin, for the first time in person, although, of course, we've communicated in various ways. And uh, Dr. Plummer, the host of Daily Dose of Greek, and I uh, met a few years ago. So, you know, we're kind of just bringing this synergy to new heights by being able to be together at the conference. So I was wondering, uh, Dr. Howe, do you mind sharing some of your immediate reactions and reflections from this conference that we just enjoyed this past weekend? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I will uh, echo the sentiment that it was fantastic to meet you in person officially. I, we've talked several times via Zoom or emails all over the place, but it was great to have everyone together. Um, I know in, in that same kind of line of thinking, um, I think it might have been the Daily Dose of Hebrew Instagram post. I don't know if it went out on the other ones, but uh, there was a picture of all four of us uh, at the um, uh, at the panel on the, the Friday night session. Uh, mm. There's me and you and Rob and Tyler were all up there together and the, the Instagram post said something like a, a historic moment or something. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. I don't. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, quite that strong, but it, it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun to to be there together and just reflecting on the conference in general. I've told several people uh, at church yesterday. People were asking me about it, and um, like it's just such a refreshing time um, for for us as hosts. I think, and I, you may you may echo this sentiment as well. But it's such a refreshing time for us as hosts because. Um, you know, we're there with like-minded people, people, we're there with people whose desire is to know and love the biblical languages and to know and love the Lord through the biblical languages. Um, and it, that's different. I, I mean this in all the right ways, but that's that's a different sort of joy than what we get in the classroom where, you know, we do have students who just, are, they just need to take this for credit. And that it just is what it is, you know, and I, I try to instill that love in them. But to have a conference like this where we've got, uh, you know, well over 200 attendees that are there because they want to be there and uh, and they love the languages. It just is so encouraging. And so. So, yeah, it was it was a fantastic time together. Mm. Are there any like highlights that stand out? And I mean, the whole thing was a highlight, of course. Yeah. <laughs> are there any particular moments that stand out that, uh, you know, you'd like to share in this way? Yeah, I um, I don't know that I've thought about particulars. I, I think the panel on Friday night with all of mm. us up there together was was particularly fun. I, I was looking forward to that time. Um, I, I think I just enjoy panels too. Like I don't feel like I have to prepare a whole lot and it can just be relaxing and enjoyable. And then you, you know, you get to answer questions that, that the the people are interested in. You, you only hope that your plenary or breakout was what they were interested in. But, you know, when they get to ask the questions um, you know, that was a, that was an enjoyable time. So. Yes. And at least for me, there's no doubt that that was the most interesting talk on Latin that I've ever heard. The plenary. Time. 
Yeah, that yeah, <laughs> that is true. I agree. And um, my uh, my kids have taken Latin classes for years at their at their school, and we're kind of shifting out of that now. We they're getting older and kind of moving on to other languages and and various things. But um, I hope they'll move on to other languages. But uh, but yeah, the, I I was thinking, man, my kids need to be here to hear this. They would they would love it. So yeah, Tyler's yes. uh, session on Latin was great. And, you know, something I'm just thinking of right now is Dr. Plummer's plenary. You did a plenary Mm -hmm. and Dr. Plummer's plenary was one that you could sort of apply to any language situation because it was language learning strategies, but also the maintenance of your language learning, which is, of course, what our daily dose ministries are trying to foster. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and, uh, you know, I think the there were a lot of strategies that he gave and and his his talk you know being on behavioral psychology why do people do what they do not just what do we want th- what do we hope they do what do we expect them to do but why do they do what they do and then try to build strategies around that um with all of that in the background you know our our kind of running mantra is a, a little bit every day um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's our heartbeat is to give a little bit every day. So, yes. Well, I, I hope the listeners of daily dose of Aramaic are experiencing that because as I'm making the episodes, of course, I'm in the text every day Yeah. as well. So, you know, I am receiving benefit even just per se on this side of the camera, you know? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's right. That's right. Cool. Well, let, let me let me ask you a few questions here, yeah, because right. as has been the case when I've had interview episodes with other Aramaists and Hebraists and so forth, that this is the time to sort of find out things about people you don't really have any other chance to have. So here we go. Um, would you mind sharing with the Daily Dose of Aramaic audience what sort of led you to become a scholar in biblical studies? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I I don't know that I would actually consider myself a scholar in biblical languages, but um, I, I feel uh, entirely inadequate most of the time. But uh, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but no, I uh, my I don't I don't really know my my college years. I, I did a microbiology and chemistry degree at uh, East Tennessee State University. So my undergraduate degree is in the sciences. I was planning to go to med school and. Um, that, that was my goal, you know, in college. And I didn't shift gears until my, uh, my third year, maybe or like late third year, early fourth year. I was so far along as just finished the sciences degree, but that's when I kind of shifted gears to full-time ministry. So my, my heart was more drawn to, to full-time ministry and, uh, and teaching. I really enjoyed teaching the Bible and, um, kind of learned, uh, through tutoring a biology class, funny enough that, teaching Mm -hmm. like I was in there tutoring had about 30 students in there from a class of 250 freshman biology students and that was when it kind of dawned on me the Lord revealed to me like man I love doing this like this is amazing Mm uh and so you know shifting gears to thinking of full-time ministry instead of uh instead of medicine the question was teaching pastor or uh higher education and and so just kind of wrestling with that over uh, the course of a few years. And then when I decided to come to seminary, um, I had my eyes set on higher education. And so that, that PhD and, uh, and so it, it really, even, even now, you know, my journey is one more of like thinking of higher education as discipleship. Um, and, 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 and I was a college pastor for a year, uh, when I was in college and then afterwards a little bit. And so like, um, you kind of, I feel like I can see at the undergraduate level, that wedding of discipleship Mm. and higher education. And so, um, you know, I, I can't deny that I've done some rather intricate and detailed and technical academic work. Um, but I still don't really feel like an academic. I, I want that academic work to fuel discipleship. And um, mm-hmm. so here I am in the field, but uh, <laughs> I uh, I still have a, a heart for discipleship. So that's fantastic. I've I've heard similar things from people yeah. who get the opportunity on a regular basis to teach at the undergraduate level. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. So. 
Well, we got into this a little bit already, but if you wouldn't mind, could you share a sketch of your academic career, especially highlighting the parts that involve the teaching and even the writing about biblical languages? Biblical languages, yeah. So, um, yeah, the parts that I left out were in seminary. Um, I didn't mean to do that, but that works well because now I could pick up right there. But um, I came to Southern Seminary uh, to work on a PhD in systematic theology with Bruce Ware. So Ooh. that was that's why I came to Southern Seminary. And so when I had huh. my mind set on PhD in higher education, I was thinking systematics. And then um, in the fall semester of 2005, uh, I took Hebrew, elementary Hebrew with TJ Betts. And um, I, I fell in love with it. I, I don't know what it was, the 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 idioms of the language, the way Hebrew uses uh, words to turn a picture and, and these sorts of things. Like, I, I just fell in love with it. Um, and uh, sometime during that year of my Hebrew studies, I met with Dr. Ware at one point to talk about doctoral work and those sorts of things. And um, we, he was just asking me about life. And I, I was like, well, I, I love Hebrew. Like, I don't know what it is, but I, I have fallen. <laughs> in love with this and he said, uh, he said, not many people talk about Hebrew the way you're talking about it. You should take that into consideration. And I had already at that point been kind of wondering, maybe shift gears to Old Testament. I, I don't, I don't know. And so, so he was helpful and in, in kind of helping to discern that. And, um, and so, yeah, that was the point where I kind of shifted gears to do Old Testament um, studies with particular focus on the languages. So during my doctoral work, I did um, Biblical Aramaic, I did Targumic Aramaic, uh, and then had several seminars in, in Hebrew. Uh, I did a, a colloquium with Peter Gentry on Northwest Semitic inscriptions, so kind of had that uh, linguistic component there as well. And, um, and yeah, I, I've loved every minute of it. I mean, every one of those classes, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I still just really, really enjoy it. So I'm just thankful to the Lord for that desire and passion and joy. Um, I did write my dissertation on the, uh, on the Memra, the Shekinah and the Yekara from the, uh, Aramaic Targums. Um, yes. and, you know, kind of a, more of a, what I would say a theological dissertation more than a linguistic dissertation, but certainly working in the languages there. Um, and I, you know, we can maybe talk more about that if you wanted to, but yeah, the, yes. the writing of Aramaic uh, writing about Aramaic was good. I, I just have to be blunt, honest right here with the daily dose of Aramaic listeners. My Aramaic would be quite rusty right now. Um, especially Targumic. I might shock myself if I opened up a text and started working through, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was all a, a joy and a delight. I mean, I, you may mention it, but the title of the dissertation was finding Christ in the old Testament through the Aramaic Memra Shekinah and Yekara. So, with that, yes. that kind of theological angle of, um, you know, seeing Christ in the Old Testament, but with with textual warrant and support, uh, it, it was it was a, a joyful project. So, yes, yes. Well, actually, I kind of was hoping you'd share with us some of the insights that, you know, any any okay. time you spend that amount of time <laughs> researching and writing on something that uh you know there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into it there are many hours but then there are the interesting discoveries yeah that come from it so could you provide e even just an overview of the findings of your dissertation research about finding christ in the old testament which was sort of via as you said the aramaic yeah. in the targums yeah yeah good so um Oh man, this is one of those questions where you, you ask a guy about his dissertation and then it's like uh you know three Here hours late, three hours <laughs> later. <you've> got... <laughs> yes. Um the problem is I'm so far removed from it now, I've got to remember what I did. But um yeah, the, the main project again was was the the memra shekinah and yekara. So the memra, for those that maybe don't don't know, is is the word. So the word of the Lord. Um and in the Aramaic Targums, uh the word of the Lord functions as kind of this character if, if we could say that and, mm -hmm. and very similar to like you said this at the conference actually very similar to like the angel of the lord or the messenger of the lord um and and you you kind of have this agent of god that's been plugged in there as a as an anti-anthropomorphic device for saying 
Yahweh did this. So instead of saying that Yahweh acted in the created order, the Targums will very often substitute the word of the Lord acted in the created order. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of a, I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to say this inaccurately. And I know that in these kinds of discussions, there's people that will be listening who want to say, well, actually, and that's fine to go <laughs> for it. Um, but it it's kind of like this Jewish creation, this rabbinic creation to keep from saying um, blasphemous things about Yahweh. Right. Yes. So, so they create this messenger, this agent that is very similar to the idea of the angel of the Lord that, you know, and we both know in, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is often hard to distinguish from the Lord himself. You know, sometimes that's and so that's kind of what this Memra character does. Well, if if Memra means the word of the Lord, um, you know, OK, jump to John one in the beginning was right. The, and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, and then um, the Memra in the Targums creates, like is the subject of verbs creating. John goes immediately in his prologue to nothing has been made that wasn't made by him. So so this word, this Memra, this Logos is the one who created. What's well, a major function of the Memra in the Targums. Uh, the Memra redeems, the Memra receives worship. Uh, think mm. about the times that, like in the book of Revelation, where angels, John will bow down to an angel and he says, get up, worship God. But in, in the Aramaic Targums, the Memra receives worship as God. And so there's just this interesting kind of, um, the the I guess the the diachronic piece here would be something mm -hmm. like in the, in the ancient synagogue, um, the uh, Hebrew Bible would be read. Some of these stipulations are in the Mishnah. So the Hebrew Bible would be read because they didn't want to mess it up. So you're looking at it on the page. But then someone would stand up and recite that passage in Aramaic according to the traditions that they that they had. And so when they recited this in Aramaic, they're they're hearing like I can you can envision the apostles sitting in the synagogue hearing the Hebrew Bible and hearing the recitation in Aramaic with this Memra character there and then going, OK, I know who that guy is. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, who knows speculation about the conversations that Jesus and the disciples had around the dinner table. But like, you know, was it maybe even clearer to them that he was that agent and manifestation of the Lord as expressed through the Memra, Shekinah and Yekara? So um, uh, Memra was kind of the main one mm. that, that I had interest in. But um, Shekinah and Yekara, the Shekinah would be the dwelling presence of the Lord. And the Yekara is the like radiant glory of the Lord. Um, and then again, go go to John's prologue. All three of those kind of come together mm. in 114. Um, yes. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld and sorry, dwelt among us that shine ah. glory. And we have beheld his radiant glory, glory as of the only begotten of the father. So um, they all three come together right there in John 114. But um, in each of the chapters, I did a chapter with Memra, a chapter with Shekinah, a chapter with Yekara, and they were all kind of divided into this concept of, you know, based on that kind of, if the apostles are using that lingo to refer to occurrences where they see Christ in the Old Testament, um, let's go now look at the Targums and see where the Memra occurs and say, that's, that is absolutely a reference to Christ. In the Old Testament, via that that vehicle of the the Memra, this one might be like you know it's questionable. You see the Memra pop up in the Targums, and maybe there's New Testament evidence that that it's a reference to Christ. Um, and then um, there was a section in all of those chapters on these are occurrences in the Targums that that are not a reference to Christ at all. There's a different reason that the word is being used. So just trying to be honest with the fact that not everywhere you see Memra, you know, it's a it's a reference to Christ. And and also just to be clear there as I'm talking, I'm realizing I just want to be clear that the Targums were not trying to reference Christ. You know, this is right, kind of right. a, you know, this is kind of a what do we hear the New Testament authors saying about the person and work of Christ? 
And how do we see the Targums portraying the Memra, the Shekinah, or the Yekara in exactly the same way? Because then you have a textual middleman of the Targums to say, here's what the Old Testament presented, here's what the New Testament presents, and this middleman kind of draws that textual link um, through through the history. So, so yeah, that that was probably too much, but that that was kind of the idea and. Um, so yeah, it was it was a great project. I really enjoyed it. Um enjoyed the Lord through it. Um mm. so so yeah, it was good. Well, so that was a few years ago now that you did your dissertation. Yeah. Uh nowadays there are really nice helps for being able to access the text of the Targums, say through the Targums module in Accordance Bible software. Were were these kind of more convenient means of looking at the text available back then? Abs yeah, absolutely. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I have <laughs> in my closet right here in my office, I have like a three inch binder of where I printed out all of the searches for Memra, Shekinah and Yekara uh, from the Accordance modules, uh, the, the Targum modules in Accordance. And um, and I, I don't I, I mean, I could not have it would have taken me. I would still be working on it if I hadn't had those helps. <laughs> so yeah, right. it made it very convenient to do those word searches and and cross reference things. And so yeah, cool, cool. Well, that's fantastic. And the kind of folks who are subscribed to Daily Dose of Aramaic ate up everything you just said. There. So that's this <laughs> good. is great. <laughs> good, good. I mean, we met these people, right? Just uh, yeah, in, I know in this it. Weekend. I know it. And it it was wonderful fellowship. So in your view. Um, what do we gain by including Aramaic alongside Hebrew and Greek in our theological training? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there could be, there probably could be theological benefits. Maybe some of the things that I just mentioned there um, that, that kind of give you theological insight of that, of the texts between the Old Testament and the New Testament that, that um, and, oh, sorry, I say texts, I've got a presupposition there, but um, at least traditions, right, that were that were available theologically with the Targums. Uh, I think with biblical Aramaic, um, I make this argument in uh, in Hebrew for life of just kind of a um, a finish the task kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you you've spent all this work on Hebrew, um, and although Aramaic is just a very you know a small sliver really of of the Old Testament texts, there's this concept of like to have the biblical languages. <laughs> Let's finish the task. And then then now yes. you actually can have an exegetical handle on Ezra and Daniel. You know, you're not just relying on everybody else. So the same arguments that we make, I think, for for Hebrew and Greek and, you know, being able to to sniff out bad theology uh, in Ezra and Daniel, particularly with Aramaic, being able to, uh, you know, kiss the bride face to face in Ezra and Daniel without having to, to kiss through a veil, you know. Those mm -hmm. kinds of images that I think are the benefits for Aramaic in the Bible. Um, but then, yeah, the Targums open up a whole nother world of uh, of literature and, and concepts theologically and what are the how the rabbis thinking about these things. Um, I think inscriptions, too. There are a lot of a lot of uh, inscriptions archaeologically that are in Aramaic uh, that that can be helpful theologically. Um, so yeah, I think there's just, I think there's wide benefits if, if, if the least, if I'm trying to think of how to say it, if the only reason you pursue Aramaic is to have a full handle on all of the biblical texts, I think that's sufficient and, and right. worth it, you know, and, but then if you go on to Targum, Targumic Aramaic or things like that, I think that can be beneficial too. Great. Well, and as we close, how would you like to encourage our listeners to use what they're learning through daily dose of Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin? All right. So, you know, oh gosh, there could be any number of things that you say here, but, but the, the primary function that I want to drive home every time I get the opportunity with the biblical languages is to love the Lord more by mining the depths of scripture. And uh, th these were kind of the, the two sister main points in my in in my plenary at the conference this past weekend um is you know if if the if we pursue the biblical languages just simply as an end in themselves 
Um, you know, we could probably plug that concept into Ecclesiastes somewhere. It's vanity. Uh, it's fleeting. Mm-hmm. You've got it. Great. It's going to be gone someday. But mm-hmm. if we use the languages and ask the Lord by his spirit to stir our hearts with our original language study so that we love him more by mining the depths of scripture, those are things that we will that will be embedded in our hearts for all eternity is that deeper love for the Lord. And so, um, so yeah, of all the number of, well, I've got to get a, I've got to do this for my degree. I've got to, you know, I, I want to do this because I need a hobby. I want, there could be any number of reasons that I would encourage people. Yes. Keep, keep going, do that. Um, but I would say have at the forefront of your brain, uh, a deeper love for the Lord by mining the depths of scripture. So, mm. Well, that's a fantastic note to conclude the Daily Dose of Aramaic uh, interview here. We definitely need to do this again somehow, maybe, I don't know, in two years at the next conference. Yeah, at the next conference. Yeah, yeah. uh, (laughs) Maybe at that one, we can do it in person. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe so. Maybe so. Well, hey, thanks to everybody for spending a few moments with us in this delightful conversation. Let's continue to mind the depths of scripture, as Dr. Howell has said, via Aramaic and Hebrew, and of course, for the the New Testament, Greek as well, and with all the cultural benefits that Dr. Flatt brought up to learning Latin. Let's, Let's do all of these things with the joy that comes from getting close to, uh, as close as we can to the message as it was originally given in Revelation. So thanks everybody for joining us today.